August 1914, the leading nations of Europe prepared to go to war. Before it is over, more than eight million men will be dead. Kings and emperors will fall. Countries will disappear from the map. The world will be forever changed. In America, President Woodrow Wilson urges the nation to be neutral in fact as well as name, impartial in thought as well as action. Why is the president so afraid America will be drawn into Europe's war? What is the great danger to our people if we fight? In 1914, America has serious problems. Massive problems with an industrial machine that has grown too big and too fast for proper laws to regulate working conditions and to protect the working man. Woodrow Wilson has been elected president on a reform ticket. He says, no one can mistake the purpose for which the country now seeks to use the Democratic Party. It seeks a change. The president is concerned with domestic reforms. He wants nothing to interfere with his domestic program. He says, it would be an ironic joke if foreign affairs would dominate my administration. But across the Atlantic, in Europe, in a country few Americans can locate on a map, a Serbian assassin's bullet takes the life of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria. Austria delivers an ultimatum to Serbia. Serbia rejects it and prepares to fight. Russia mobilizes to come to the aid of her ally, Serbia. Germany takes the side of Austria. France and England prepare for war. In America, President Wilson offers to mediate the dispute. America stands ready to help the rest of the world. But no one listens. His words are drowned out by the guns of August. Europe has been preparing for this war for a long time. Now the mighty German war machine, most powerful army the world has ever seen, moves against France. And because France is heavily fortified on the eastern border she shares with Germany, the German army circles to the west, smashing and invading through neutral Belgium. The Kaiser wires Wilson. Belgian neutrality has to be violated on strategic grounds. The German chancellor sneers that the treaty with Belgium is a scrap of paper. Germany's action stuns the world. Americans are outraged, but President Wilson urges the nation to be calm. The war is far away. American lives and property are not at stake. Wilson reasons, my fellow countrymen, the people of the United States are drawn from many nations and chiefly from the nations now at war. Some wish one nation, others another, to succeed in this momentous struggle. The United States must be neutral in fact as well as name. Most Americans agree, this is Europe's war. And from the time of George Washington, we have been warned to stay out of Europe's conflicts. Let's stay out of it. Wilson continues with his domestic program. But Americans are aroused by newspaper stories and pictures of German atrocities in Belgium. 
and as the German army rolls onward, crushing everything in its path, some Americans become afraid. If France is defeated, if England surrenders, if Germany rules the continent, how long will America itself be safe? Should America act to save civilization from collapsing? Now at the Marne River, a miracle takes place. With the help of reinforcements rushed from Paris by taxicab, the combined French and British army slows and stops the German advance. And while Germany has been winning on land, the British rule the seas. The British Navy begins to enforce a blockade that will strangle German trade. It will not be a short war. Already it has affected the American economy. Huge war orders send American factories working overtime. More and more workers are needed. Higher wages result. Europe's war is making America prosperous. But is America truly neutral? Germany sees that the vast resources of the American industrial machine, the food, the munitions, the loans, are keeping Germany's enemies fighting in the field. American goods shipped abroad can reach France and England, but not Germany and the Central Powers. Trade with the Allies doubles and quadruples. Trade with Germany dwindles to almost nothing. Germany must break the blockade. She has only one weapon, the submarine. Striking without warning, German submarines begin to sink Allied ships. Wilson warns Germany, if an American is killed or an American ship sunk, the United States will hold the German government accountable and will take any steps necessary. May 1st, 1915. The luxurious British liner, Lusitania, sails from New York. Aboard are hundreds of Americans. They ignore a notice published next to the announcement of the ship sailing, a warning inserted by the German government. Travelers sailing in the war zone do so at their own risk. May 7th, 1915, the Lusitania is sunk. 128 Americans are lost. Now there is a sense of crisis in Washington. The president wants to hold Germany accountable, but the Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, says this will lead to war. After three days of almost complete isolation, on May 10th, Wilson says, There is such a thing as a man being too proud to fight. There is such a thing as a nation being so right that it does not need to convince others by force that it is right. To many Americans, this is a sign of cowardice. Theodore Roosevelt, the man whom Wilson has defeated for the presidency, says, we are passing through a thick stream of yellow in our national life. But while Roosevelt is denouncing Wilson's milk and water policies, the president is preparing such a stiff note to Germany that his peace-loving Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, resigns. If Germany rejects the note, America is at war. But the German Kaiser backs down and agrees to suspend unrestricted submarine warfare. Woodrow Wilson has won a major diplomatic victory. Nineteen sixteen. The war has settled down into a bloody stalemate. Armies dig in for trench warfare, separated by only a few yards of no man's land. Guns never cease. Men go out of their minds. It was the noise, the never-ending noise. 
Paris. Verdun becomes the bloodiest battle in all history. Almost a million casualties. Fighting back and forth on the Somme, England and Germany lose another million men. Reading the mounting casualty lists, Woodrow Wilson is horrified by the brutality of modern war. Once lead the American people into this war, and they will forget there ever was such a thing as tolerance. To fight, you must be brutal, and the spirit of ruthless brutality will enter into the very fiber of our national life. The only sure way America can stay out of this war is to find some way to end it. Wilson sends his aide, Colonel House, on peace missions to Europe. He pleads for a peace without victory. But both sides have lost too many men. Both sides are bitter. Victory is what each demands. Meanwhile, in America, a presidential election is drawing near. Wilson says, if my re-election as president depends upon my getting into war, I don't want to be president. The Democratic Party campaigns on the slogan, he kept us out of war. They emphasize that Wilson is the peace candidate. They say that Charles Evans Hughes, loudly backed by Theodore Roosevelt, is the war candidate. But secretly, Woodrow Wilson has serious doubts. The rush of events is taking control from his hands. Any insignificant German lieutenant committing an atrocity can plunge this nation into war. American opinion is divided. Men like Theodore Roosevelt, members of the Army League and the Navy League are for America to get into the war immediately. Women pacifists march with signs, real patriots keep cool. Millions of German Americans have sentimental ties to the motherland, contribute to the German cause. November 1916, the presidential election is so close, Woodrow Wilson goes to bed thinking he has been defeated. He awakens to find he's been re-elected by a narrow margin. Most Americans want peace, but a substantial number are against Wilson's policies. What shall he tell the people? I know you are depending upon me to keep this nation out of war. So far, I have done so. But you have laid another duty on me. You have bidden me to see to it that nothing stains the honor of the United States. And that is a matter not within my control. That depends on what others do. In Washington, the president has once again called for peace. But in Berlin, a decision has already been made. Germany is being strangled by this blockade. Her people are going hungry. If the war goes on much longer, Germany will lose. It no longer matters whether America comes into the war. The German high command believes America cannot arm in time to make any difference. February 1st, 1917, Germany announces all out, unrestricted submarine warfare. And while more and more American ships are being sunk, while Woodrow Wilson still holds back from war and only arms American merchant ships to defend themselves, there comes another thunderbolt. The British Secret Service has intercepted a telegram the German Foreign Secretary Zimmermann has sent to Mexico. We offer Mexico an alliance. Make war together. Make peace together. For her aid, Mexico is to receive in return Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Theodore Roosevelt says, There is no question of declaring war on Germany. Germany has declared war on us. Wilson tells a reporter, For nights, I have been lying awake, going over the whole situation. 
I have tried every way I know to avoid war. What else can I do? Is there anything else I can do? But being the kind of man he is, a man of high ideals and missionary purpose, Woodrow Wilson cannot simply go to war out of revenge. If America is to pay the high cost in the blood of its young men, the war must have a new and inspiring purpose. On April 2nd, 1917, the president goes before Congress and says, it is a fearful thing to lead this great people into war, but the right is more precious than peace. It is to be a war to end war, a war to make the world safe for democracy. It is to be a crusade for a world founded on decency, honor, and law. All things German become suspect. Sauerkraut is renamed Liberty Cabbage. Some high schools stop teaching German. The president has promised force. Force to the uttermost, force without stint or limit. Under the leadership of Bernard M. Baruch, the War Industries Board supervises American industry and production. Herbert Hoover is appointed food administrator. William Gibbs McAdoo becomes director general of the nation's railroads. Felix Frankfurter heads up the War Labor Board to mediate labor disputes. Under Edward N. Hurley, the United States Shipping Board acquires large fleets to transport and supply the American Expeditionary Forces. Domestic reforms, new labor laws are no longer important. Men, women, and children work overtime to turn out munitions. The nation's war effort will cost $33 billion of which two-thirds are raised through the sale of Liberty Bonds, and one-third raised through increased income and corporate taxes. Through volunteers and the draft, the armed forces expand from 200,000 men to 4,800,000 by the end of the war. The nation sings the new hit song. Over there, over there, Send the word, send the word over there That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming The drums, drum humming everywhere So prepare, say a prayer Send the word, send the word Ironically, beware. for a war to save the world for democracy, the Americans will send a Jim Crow army overseas. At first, the nation is so unprepared to make war, the soldiers have to train with wooden guns. And while Americans train with wooden guns, on the battlefields, the Allied armies are reeling. On the high seas, German submarines are sinking ships at the rate of almost a million tons a month. Can America send an army overseas in time to turn the tide? June 13, 1917. General Pershing lands in France at the head of the 1st American Division. The sight of the fresh American troops, the realization that the Yanks are coming by the tens of thousands, stiffens Allied morale. Realizing the threat from America, Germany goes all out. In a series of hammer blows, the Russian army is routed on the Eastern Front. Russia collapses and sues for a separate peace. Riots take place in Russian cities. Germany is now able to send all her troops in the East to the Western Front. Now the Americans go into action. At Thunderwood, Chateau Thierry, they prove they can fight. Simultaneously in America, Woodrow Wilson fights a war with words. January 1918, Wilson announces 14 points for a better world. The 14th point calls for a League of Nations to be formed to preserve world peace. 
Shrewdly, he drives a wedge between the Kaiser and the German people. America has no conflict with the German people. Germany launches an offensive and is stopped by the Allied armies with the help of fresh American troops. Now, for the first time, the Americans go on the offensive. A German lieutenant writes, The Americans have annihilated two of our companies. They fight like devils. Worn out now from four long years of war, realizing it can no longer win, the German will to fight collapses. Rebellion breaks out in German cities. The Kaiser flees for safety to Holland. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, in November 1918, for the first time in four years, a stillness falls on the battlefield. Armistice. Men go mad with joy. They are alive. They have survived. But more than eight million have not. American losses total 48,000. Now, while the nation returns to peace, Woodrow Wilson realizes his battle is only beginning. For the first time in history, an American president goes to Europe during his term in office. Woodrow Wilson sails to fight for his 14 points. The president is confident he can handle the Europeans. But men like Clemenceau of France and Lloyd George of England burn with a hatred of the Germans. Soon Clemenceau and Wilson are no longer on speaking terms. Talk to Wilson. How can I talk to a fellow who thinks himself the first man for 2,000 years who knows anything about peace on Earth? Wilson imagines he is the second messiah. Out of the wreckage of the old Europe, the men who make the Treaty of Versailles create a new map. New nations are born. Decisions and national boundaries are made so hurriedly, mistakes are bound to be made. Wilson is discouraged, but he has salvaged his 14th point. Now he returns to America to get Congress to ratify his great idea. But the president has been away six months. He has lost contact and control of the country. And Wilson's enemies are furious because the president had not invited a single Republican to help make the important decisions in Europe. In Washington, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, an old foe of Wilson's, ties up the motion to join the League of Nations in endless debate. The president takes his case directly to the people. He travels thousands of miles, makes speech after speech, in city after city, telling what the League means to the world. Wilson is weary and discouraged, but despite failing health, he refuses to give up his great crusade. On September 26, 1919, he suffers a paralytic stroke. Back in the White House, Mrs. Wilson tries to protect her sick husband. She refuses admission to visitors. She makes important decisions. Men begin to whisper, A woman is running the country. The sick man is stubborn. He feels that if America refuses to join the League, the whole war will be fought for nothing. Opponents of the League bring witness after witness against the peace treaty. Men remember and quote George Washington's advice to stay out of Europe's wars. The League of Nations is defeated. In 1920, the country elects a president who promises a return to normalcy. 
only with the passage of time and the threat of a greater conflict would thoughtful people ask themselves, had we helped win the First World War? Only to throw away the peace? Hey!